Um, I had a really cool experience on the airplane uh, going to Colombia. There was a there was a lady who was Colombian, but she spoke English. She was coming from uh, from Georgia to Bogota, the capital, in Colombia. And my companion from NTC and I, we sat next to her, and um, we had a really cool experience sharing the Book of Mormon with her. And uh, we were two gringos, two white boys, going to Colombia on our own, little, like little kids. And so she was just really, really friendly and outgoing, and she kind of took it upon herself to be our mother. And so she told us all about Colombia and the people, and, and she told us to watch a lot of TV, to learn Spanish. So we smiled, and, <laughs> uh, and we gave her a Book of Mormon. She said she was struggling in, in life. We, so we told her that and the Book of Mormon would help to, um, uh, she could find the answers to her prayers, to her to the questions of what she should do in, in life. And so, and so it was just a really neat experience we had, that, that very first moment going into Colombia. We arrived there, um, we got off the plane, and there were the, the two assistants, um, took us um, to the uh, to this missionary home where we spent the night, and then my companion, who who served in a different mission, mission was sent away the next day, and then I went to my area. Uh, but Colombia was beautiful. I just remember that the uh, that is so green and so beautiful. We went to the that mission office, and it's just a beautiful spot up there in the city with the red buildings and the the green mountains. Um, I was surprised that it was colder than I expected because Bogota is higher in the mountains, higher altitude. So it isn't as hot as I thought it would be. It wasn't as jungly, but it was still very beautiful, breathtaking. Well, in the city of Bogota, um, it's a lot of, let's see, the houses are made of cement for the most part. And in one block, the whole block will be basically the same cement figure, the same cement building. They don't have spaces between the houses like we do here. Uh, so it's all kind of meshed together and it, and it has a, like a very squared um, uh, kind of Hispanic look to it. The buildings are, are usually colorful, red or blue or green with, with bright colored designs on them. Um, that look really uh, uh, Hispanic, really Latin, beautiful actually. I found that in in Bogota there's lots of security, so they so usually every every house, like between the houses, there there will be fences uh, with locks on them and, and a lot of security. And uh, and so walking down the streets. Uh, uh, one thing, it took me a really, really long time to learn my first area because it seemed like every street looked the same. It was all, it was all kind of meshing together. All of the houses that were so different than the houses I knew all kind of looked the same to me. So it was really hard for me to learn the different streets and to know where I was. I started out in a fairly big area. We, we, we traveled a lot all over the place and it was just really, it was difficult for me to learn, to learn the different streets. But after a while, then it, it just became second nature. And I knew where I was, and I, I got a sense of direction. After that, after my first area, I never struggled. I never had a problem learning my, learning my areas after that. It was just the first time. Kind of interesting. But that's kind of how the, the, uh, um, how the buildings are. Most buildings in, on the block are three stories, um, between three and five stories tall. And... Um, and typically a family will live in, in uh, uh, if it's a, it's a wealthier family, they'll live in, in two or three of the floors. Or if not, then every floor will be a different family. Or you'll even see some places where they'll go deep in. There will be five apartments in, in, a, in a complex in, in just this little tiny square of three-story cement building. And... Uh, uh, so it's a lot more, people live in a lot more condensed space. It's a big city there. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the population is now, but I, I believe that it's estimated 8 million people in the city. So it's a fairly big city, and there's a lot of um, 
a lot of density, a lot of people living close to each other. So not a lot of space like in other places. So when I arrived in Colombia, there were four missions there. The Barranquilla mission, which is the north coast of Colombia. Cali, which is the west, uh, west Colombia on the west coast. Um, Bogota north, which is um, the smallest mission in Colombia, which is the Bogota, the capital, is kind of right in the center of Colombia. So it was that area right in the north, uh, right underneath the, the, the coast, the mission of the coast, uh, Barranquilla. So you have Bo Bogota north, and then Bogota south was the biggest mission territory, uh, as far as territory is concerned. It covered the most space, and that was my mission. Uh, but most, all of my mission, almost, I think, 80% of my mission was just pure jungle. It was, it was just a lot of a lot of green, and then with, with a few cities in there. And, uh, well, there were a lot of cities, but, but then the mission covered a f a f just the major cities of that area. And most of the mission was not occupied by missionaries. Most of my mission was just jungle. And uh, so, yeah, and, and in my mission, Bogota South, there's no coastline, so there was no ocean. The closest I ever got to, to the ocean was, was being in the Amazon, and that was just on the river. So there, there are a lot of rivers in in Colombia and uh, so those are those are the missions what halfway through my mission they they created a new mission which was the Medellin mission which is a city in the in north of Cali on the west coast so they split Cali and Barranquilla uh, right there where they where they meet up into another mission so now presently there are five missions in Colombia well I I do know that Colombia used to be um, what is now Venezuela and Ecuador, all all those three countries put together, and Panama. All of that used to be Colombia, and they were split by uh, in revolution or uh, an independence. There was some um, like a, I don't I don't think there was a war. I'm I'm not I don't know the history exactly. But what used to be Ecuador, or what, what is now Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela, and, and Panama is now, used to all be Colombia, but they split the countries. And if you look at the flags, for the, Ecuador, the, the Ecuadorian flag, and the Colombian flag, and the Venezuelan flag, they all have the same colors, which is yellow, blue, and red um, stripes. And, uh, and the Colombian flag is just that. It's, it's yellow, blue, red stripes. And, uh, but the Ecuador, Ecuadorian flag and the Venezuelan flag, they have uh, crests on them and, and different things, but they are, they're all similar because they all used to be the same country. In the Amazon, there are uh, interesting animals, um, like pink dolphins, which is, uh, I, I, believe that, I believe that they only, they only grow in, in the Amazon area of South America. Uh, and nowhere else. They have these pink dolphins. Um, and there's actually a legend of the pink dolphin. If you go there, they'll tell you about it. But it's, it's, um, it's this legend that, that the, in the villages years ago, the pink dolphins would come and attack the villages and steal away the women. And then they would have children with these women that were half dolphin, half human. And, uh, and so you see, you see in, uh, in the in Leticia, uh, all over they have paintings and art of of a, a a man with a dolphin head, or a dolphin with like a man head, or or like a, a dolphin with human features all over it, and like a sword because he's a warrior or whatever. And so that's a so that's a big uh, part of the culture is the the pink dolphins of the Amazon. They also um, have piranhas, but People think, I think people have the impression that piranhas are more dangerous than they actually are. If you are bleeding and you're swimming around in the Amazon, then they can smell the blood like a shark, but they're really not so dangerous that, that if you jump in the water, you'll get swarmed and attacked by piranhas. Probably not. Uh, in fact, people swim in the Amazon all the time. The children are climbing up in trees, jumping in the Amazon, jumping in the river with their friends, and... Uh, 
and people even bathe in the river and wash their clothes in the river, which I don't understand because it's it's the dirtiest river I've ever seen. <laughs> but we were walking down this like little this little plank bridge right on top of the river. So the river was right underneath us and it was the sun was just going down and my companion and, and I were walking and I was going and right in front of him and it was a really narrow bridge and there were no railing on the side. It was just these little wooden planks on top of the water. And there were a group of three guys walking towards us. And so they were walking towards us and I was walking on this side. And, uh, and there was a piece of wood, a little plank of wood that, that was kind of starting to rot out. And I stepped right in the middle of it and my foot stepped right through and, uh, and I fell backwards into the water. And uh, my companion started to fall too. He started falling right on top of me. But the three men that were there grabbed him and then they grabbed me and pulled me out of the water before I sank down. And so uh, from the waist down, I was wet, but, but I didn't, my upper body didn't get wet. But my pants were entirely soaked and my shoes. And um, yeah, luckily though, my scriptures, I had them put in these plastic bags so that the water wouldn't, make them wet when it rained and so they were fine and uh, but my um, my my diary my uh, my schedule my agenda was totally wet and uh, it was it was it was not fun it was really gross the rivers the rivers there is kind of gross but but it's a cool experience I get you know I fell in the Amazon or yeah, my companion laughed about that. <laughs> I had the opportunity to serve in the Amazon rainforest uh, on the, in a little town called Leticia, which I loved. It was beautiful there. And it was a much, much smaller city. So I remember uh, we had bikes in that area. We couldn't bike in Bogota. We, we walked everywhere we went. But in Leticia, we had bikes. And so we could bike from one side of the city to the other side of the city and be there in five to ten minutes so and our area was the smallest area of the city but we we were out on the river and the in on the amazon the houses are made of wood on the river they build the houses of wood and and they build them on top of sticks so they're just these wooden houses on on sticks and they build them that way because the river the river grows during the year and and it floods little by little and so the water keeps raising and raising and raising and it, it rise, rises all the way up to, to the to the houses the year I was there the the river rose more than it had in in 26 years so all of the houses on the river were flooded some of them up to the rooftop were flooded so the families evacuated for three or four months and lived in like lived in gymnasiums or in little in these in these other buildings where they all kind of camped out for a few months and for the river to go down again and then they all returned to their homes really interesting really fascinating you see a lot of people riding in on canoes there were some places that we weren't we weren't able to get to because because an island out in the middle of the river we we couldn't take canoes out there but uh but it was just it was just a beautiful place they would have bridges between the houses on the river. So we'd walk out on these these wooden bridges. And one time I actually fell into the river, I fell in the Amazon. The Colombians cook really well. I love the food out in Colombia. Um, they mostly, I think, I think what Colombia is um, really good with is are the fruits. There's a lot of fruit, it's a really tropical country. So they have a lot of really exotic fruits. I remember the first really weird fruit that I had when I was there is called uh, granadilla. And um, I asked my companion, I said, what's some weird Colombian fruit that I can taste for the experience? And he said, eat this, and it's granadilla. And it's like, a, it's kind of like a, sh a little shaker is what it looks like. It's, a, it's like a ball with a, with a little handle on it. And uh, you, you pop into the shell of it or into the skin. And on the inside is this kind of bluish, uh, jello-y, brain-looking substance. It's really weird. It's little seeds with all this little gooey blue uh, 
fruit in it and and so you just take it like this you you pull it open and you suck and you suck the blue stuff out just like that and it's sweet it's it's pretty good it has a strange aftertaste to it but it's uh it's pretty it's a pretty cool fruit there is a lot of fruit like that a lot of exotic strange fruits i'd say the fruit was probably my favorite and uh, the colombians drink drink juice with every meal a juice or maybe a soda um and uh but not water it's always a juice and it's usually a freshly made juice that they get the fruit and then they'll juice it um normally you'll have rice with every meal i learned to love rice <laughs> it is great uh, they eat a lot of chicken and a lot of meat there. Um, so on your plate for lunch, um, the principal meal in Colombia is lunch. So uh, typically you'll have rice with a salad um, uh, and maybe potatoes uh, or yuca, which is like a, which is like a root vegetable, and uh, a little bit of chicken with a with a sauce on it or a piece of meat or something or an egg and uh, and platano which is like a really big banana they they'll cut those up in slices and then they'll fry them and they're really good um, so that's kind of your typical meal a lot of times before the meal you'll have a soup they make they make delicious soups in Colombia too I actually ate piranha on, on my mission there was a restaurant that served it um, so I, I, I figured I'd buy piranha, you know, for the experience. So they, they gave me this plate with these two big piranha heads sticking out there with the teeth. And, and, uh, and I was sitting there looking at them and, and eating these, these fish. And I, I'm thinking to myself, the tables have turned, my friends, it's, it's my turn. And uh, so I ate piranha. It was, it was good. I mean, it's fish. And um, that same restaurant, they serve uh, what is called mojojoy which is a grub it's a it's a white worm about as big as my finger uh and and about twice as twice the size around in width so it's this big fat white worm with a black head and it wiggles around there and the people there eat them eat them live they just pop the heads off and they they suck the inside uh or or they'll just eat it with the skin and uh so they, we had the option to eat them fried or to eat them live. And I tried, I tried. I, I sat there with my, that worm in my, I couldn't do it. I couldn't eat them. So I had them fry it for me. And I ate them, I ate them fried. And it wasn't so bad. It wasn't as bad as, uh, as what, what's, uh, what they call um, chunchuyo, which is cow intestines. I had a pretty bad experience once eating chunchuyo. Uh, it wasn't as bad as that. Uh, I definitely prefer mojojoy, worm. Um, but since since I brought it up, why don't I tell you that my experience with the chunchuyo? So we had this big barbecue at the in my first area, where there was it was a celebration. So. Um, for special occasions, when when they want to have a, a big barbecue or big a big pit out in the back where they they fry up meat and stuff, they they invite all their friends and their family, and we all come over, and they they cook uh, every part of the cow there is except for the meat. They cook up the heart and the stomach and the, and the liver and the intestines and, uh, and the tongue and everything. So, so I got my plate and they're sticking all this stuff. The first time I saw this, this big heart and this liver on my plate, I thought, oh, are these exotic mushrooms or something? It doesn't look like meat. And I'm eating this and I'm like, that's really interesting. And they told me what it was. I thought, oh, well, I better eat it, right? Yeah. Uh, but kind of gross. After, and then, and then they had this big tube looking thing on there and I knew what it was. It's chunchuyo, which is the intestine of the cow. Normally in Colombia, when they serve chunchuyo, they'll cut it up into small pieces and fry it. And it's a little more bearable that way. But they had it served us in these big, long strips. So I'm sitting there with this big, long strip, and there's like this gray, muddy stuff on the inside. And I'm thinking, I don't want to eat this. But uh, it, um, 
um, it was kind of like bubble gum. It was you, you would bite it off and chew it and chew it and chew it. And then uh, af after it didn't get any smaller, you just get sick of chewing it and swallow. And so that's what it was kind of like. You just little by little down it. And then they gave us a little cup of juice. And that juice is precious. That juice is precious. You just, you have to savor it and, and save it. Because you're going to want it. <laughs> so, yeah. Exotic foods in Colombia. We saw really cool animals in the Amazon. Um, there's a little tour that's taken because there, there are a lot of tours that go down to Leticia for the Amazon experience. And, and so when we went down there, they took us on this, on this tour out on, and we, we got in this boat. Our mission president took us down once when he came and, and he, he took us into this boat and we went down the river and we're sailing down this river and we stop at a, a little spot, uh, with a big, uh, big bridge out and further into the into the inland and uh, and they had all all of these big beautiful colorful birds that are called guacamayos and uh, they're big uh, with with bright red feathers red and yellow and blue feathers and green and white and blue feathers and um, and they and they one of them represents uh, Brazil, the one that is the green and the white, and then the one who is red and yellow uh, and blue is for Colombia because those kind of match the colors of the flag for Brazil. And since Leticia is right on the border with with Brazil, there they have those colorful, big, beautiful birds that are like oversized parrots. And uh, so we went up to these parrots and they, these these guacamayos. And they crawl on our shoulders and around our backs and on our arms. And uh, you feed them the crackers and stuff. But uh, we took pictures with the birds and I actually got bit on the cheek by one of them. He was, uh, he was feisty. But uh, we went further down this tour on the river and we went to this place called Monkey Island. And they call it Monkey Island because, they're, because it's full of monkeys. So you get on the island, and there are people that sit there and with their, uh, uh, with, with their little like souvenirs that they make out, out of wood and things, and, and they're selling like little gifts and things. And you get you get in on this tour, and this and this guy takes you out into, the, out on the trail, and and everybody lifts up a banana, and uh, and the monkeys jump down on top of you, and they jump on your head, and they crawl all around you, and they eat your bananas. And you take all the, you get take your pictures with the monkeys, and it's kind of cool. So I got a picture with like six monkeys hanging on, hanging all over me. It was kind of cool. After after the monkeys, and we went back up the other way, and on the other side of the river is Peru. So this is so the spot where I was in the Amazon was was three borders: Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. So on the other side was Peru, and so our president took us to this little spot in Peru called Puerto Alegria. Which is um, like a little a little village, a tiny little village community uh, in Peru on the river, where they have all kinds of exotic animals that they that they keep there and that they that they that they grow, that they raise and and um, and they had an ocelot, which was which is like a it's like a leopard, but it's smaller. It was five years old. It was full grown. But it's really big. This oversized cat is huge, also, and it's a wild cat. But it was, uh, I guess, domesticated because it was just a, a beautiful, beautiful cat with black spots. And uh, and they let us pick it up and pet it, and uh, and it purred for us. And its purr kind of sounded like a growl. But uh, but yeah. So I had I got a picture with the ocelot and the like, cuddling it in my arms and. With this little little bottle, and I stuck my fingers in his mouth, and he was sucking my, on my fingers like like he was like it was his little bottle. Yeah, it was a, it was great. Uh, they had little turtles there, and other birds, and monkeys, and sloths, and uh, a big big crocodile. Also, they had in the water we went out and saw it. it was pretty cool. Um, after that, we went we went back from the tour, and we. Got back into Leticia and got back to work. 
<laughs> so, well, this was the story that probably changed my life on my mission. Uh, it probably made the biggest difference on how I saw how I saw my mission and how I, my mission affected my life. And uh, I want to be careful about the way that I explain it. <clears throat> First of all, to understand kind of where I was coming from uh, up in up until the end of my mission with only a couple of days left, two days left before I went home. I looked back on my mission and I thought to myself, have I been, have I been a successful missionary? Have I um, done all that the Lord wanted me to do? Have I um, raised my, to His expectations? Have I been obedient enough? Have I worked hard enough? Have I touched enough people's lives? And I looked back over my mission, asking myself these questions. And I thought to myself, um, I, could have, I could have done better. This point in my mission, I, I should have been a better companion to that companion. I should have been a better missionary at that point. I, I could have done this better. Maybe it, there were some times I was afraid of my mission and I didn't talk to people that I thought I should have. Or maybe I felt an impression that I didn't follow. And then it was tearing at me a little bit. And I thought to myself, I, I don't know if I, if I would consider myself a successful missionary um, or an obedient enough missionary. I don't know if I would consider myself um, good enough. And so two days left of my mission, the time had passed and there was nothing more that I could do, almost. It was just a couple of days left. We had put together this uh, program. I was, uh, I was with, there were four missionaries, us, we were living together. And the four of us were, we were all North American missionaries, and all of us uh, had some musical talent. So the four of us decided we were going to put together a, a fireside for the members and the investigators in the stake. And this was at a stake center where I had spent the majority of my mission, um, 16 months of my mission in the stake. Uh, in three of the different areas, and in, in two of the areas I served twice. And so uh, I had served for over a year in, these, uh, in, this, in this zone, in this stake. And so we had a stake fireside. So many of the people in the, in the stake, I knew them personally, and I had had experiences with them, and, and I had been in their houses, and they had fed me lunch, and they had given me references, and, and some of them I had... I had baptized and and um, and it was uh, it was just a good experience where er, a lot of the people that I loved most in my mission were there. This was in Bogota, and uh, so there we were. We put on this this beautiful fireside that we that we uh, a music fireside that we had prepared. Um, we got a, a we were able to scrounge up a guitar and a violin and a harmonica, and I played harmonica and. Uh, and one of my companions, Elder Fife, played the violin, and Elder McIntyre played guitar. Elder Jones played piano. And the four of us together put together these songs where we kind of took the audience on a journey. We took the, uh, the congregation on a journey from, of the life of Joseph Smith and the history of the church where we told the first vision story. We, we played a little fiddle music there at the beginning. This was... Um, it was on a Sunday night, um, and the church was packed. And we played a little bit of like old folk tunes there at the beginning to get them all in the mood. And then we started telling the Joseph Smith story with a big projector up at the back where you saw Joseph Smith live his life, asking the questions, uh, what, what is the church, the true church, and, and how that led into the restoration. And then this big peace and reverence fell over everyone. And, uh, and everybody uh, felt the spirit there. From from there, we led on to the church history. We showed a little bit from the film, the Seventeen Miracles. We we showed a, a couple of clips from there, and we told stories and sang songs about the the saints going west and about the the church growing and about missionary work. And it was all just very beautiful. And we we all sang and we and we played instruments and and there was beautiful, beautiful music. When it was over, I, I ended with a with the song, Oh My Soul Hungered. Um, I sang this solo to, 
the congregation and I sat down and the whole audience or the whole congregation was just this, with this calm and peacefulness over everybody and I'm sitting here looking out on the people that I love and thinking about my mission it's the two years they 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 went by quickly and thinking what what's going to happen to me now and I only had two days left and Elder Fife one of my companions he stood up and we had a, he he had been a very close friend on my mission he stood up and he got to the pulpit and uh, and uh, in this moment of reverence this moment of quiet he said to everybody um, uh, Elder Fifield's going to be going home in a couple of days and I'm really going to miss him because he's he's meant a lot to me and he's been a very good friend um, and uh and he knew that that I was struggling a little bit or I don't think that I told him but he must have felt something anyways he he did something that night that really changed my life and he looked out on the at the congregation and he said um, maybe Elder Fifield didn't baptize the most people but I know that he was a successful missionary and uh, I know that that he changed people's lives he said I want to do something tonight if everybody who's here, um, if um, if you have felt that that Elder Fifield touched your life in some way, I want you to stand up. And uh, the the majority, almost everybody there in the room, immediately stood up on their feet and uh, and looked at me, and it was just an overwhelming moment in my life where. I couldn't I couldn't hold back the tears because because I knew that that God was proud of me because I had touched their lives and I had been able to show my love to them and I wasn't a perfect missionary but I didn't have to be perfect I just I loved the people and I loved those people and I was able to make a difference in their lives and so seeing all of those people stand on their feet as a as a as an act of as a tribute to me, as a, an act of love towards me, it, it changed the way I saw my whole mission. And I knew then that, that my mission wasn't a failure. That my mission was, it was that God was proud of me for what I had done in those two years. And that I could be, I could be okay with that, with not being perfect and, and with having done my best. And so, and that was a, that was just a beautiful experience on my mission. Um, Elder Fife is giving his homecoming talk this Sunday. I'm excited to go see him. Uh, so that's uh, that is probably the the event of my mission that I feel changed my life more than anything.